microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the 16th of November in the 46th week of 2012. For more than 20 years, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on a so-called community radio station, and when censored and locked out of there, uh, an activity, by the way, that's been repeated this week. It's interesting. There's a lot of this going around. Uh, our program was welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people here at Urbana Public Television. I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussants tonight are David Green and Ron Zoak. We'll take turns suggesting an item from the week's news that's been ignored or misreported, sometimes even innocently, and then giving the others a chance to comment on it. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking since about American politics for more than twice the 20 years that we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. This is SOA weekend uh, in Benning, Fort Benning, Georgia. The School of America's Watch Group demonstrates on the first weekend of uh, on the weekend before Thanksgiving and has done so for many years. This weekend, November 16th to 18th, thousands of human rights activists, torture survivors, anti-war veterans, students, families, union workers, nuns, artists, and others will converge at the gates of Fort Benning, Georgia, to call on the Obama administration to end the U.S. militarization of the Americas and to close the School of Americas, the School of Assassins at Fort Benning, Georgia, where more than two generations of American operatives, that is, American operatives in other countries, the militaries of other countries, uh, have been schooled in the techniques of subversion, assassination, and so forth, as the U.S. tries to control its, quote, backyard, close quote, that is Latin America, and hundreds of thousands of people have died as a result of this American program. Hence the ongoing uh, demonstrations, and this weekend uh, is uh, that weekend for this year. Um, the 16th of November is also in 1989, uh, was also the occasion of the murder of six Jesuit priests, their housekeeper and her daughter, women were raped, uh, by American-trained uh, School of America soldiers, uh, officers of a El Salvadorian troop uh, sponsored by the United States uh, and uh, the officers of which were trained at the Schools of America. That happened on this day in 1989, uh, part of the U.S. supported death squads uh, beginning in the Kennedy administration. The U.S. promoted death squads throughout Latin America to eliminate uh, those who um, uh, did not do what the U.S. had in mind in those countries and therefore uh, these priests who were seen to be the intellectual leaders of the, uh, uh, the revolt against U.S. interests in Salvador were killed by uh, these American-trained operatives, uh, along with their housekeeper and her daughter, uh, to protect U.S. interests. Uh, the death squads uh, were a feature of American policy throughout Latin America and continue to be so to this day. Remarkably enough, uh, the Special Operations Command, which is the modern uh, form of these death squads in the Pentagon, uh, the spokesman of this group claims that this special operation group is, at ac is active in no less than 120 countries. This isn't some leftist group saying that's what these guys are doing. This is the Special Operations Command itself, uh, which General Petraeus was once in charge of, uh, claiming uh, that this is indeed what, announcing that this is indeed what it's doing. Um, Today, of course, the chief U.S. client is busily killing people in the Gaza Strip, uh, but it's part of the same uh, imperial uh, control, attempted com imperial control that, w that is operative uh, throughout Latin America and for which the School of Americas is a uh, important support. So you're watching News from Neptune, the Evil Empire edition, and uh, Ron Zoe gets to choose the first evil today. <laughs> well, 
I want to start by uh, mentioning what I will call some scenes from the class struggle in Europe. Here, here. And uh, um, call attention to a couple of uh, headlines. Uh, going back actually to February, there's a AP article, Athens reviews steep cuts demanded for the new bailout. So uh, the point here apparently is to maintain or restore investor confidence that their bonds will uh, pay off and to appease Germany and the international uh, economic and monetary uh, authorities that are trying to organize uh, some bailout of the uh, Greek economy. So uh, just a few days ago, um, there's another Reuters article headlined Anti-Austerity Strikes Sweep Southern Europe. Police and protesters clashed in Spain and Italy on Wednesday as millions of workers went on strike against Europe to protest against spending cuts they say have made the economic crisis uh, worse. worse. Hundreds of flights were canceled, car factories and ports were at a standstill and trains barely ran in Spain and Portugal where unions held their first coordinated general strike. In Spain, 81 people were arrested after scuffles at picket lines and damage to storefronts. Riot police in Madrid fired rubber bullets at protesters, uh, and so on and on. Central Rome, students stoned police in a protest over money-saving plans for the school system. Uh, it was the biggest Europe-wide challenge by organized labor to austerity policies that have aggravated recessions and mass unemployment in nearly three years since the start of the Eurozone's debt crisis. Uh, so uh, a good deal more uh, there, which I think is uh, edifying. Uh, close to 26 million people are uh, unemployed in the European Union while governments take aim at spending on treasured universal health care and public schools. In effect, taking resources away from the middle class and the lowest class. And, and so you can uh, uh, restore investor confidence. Quoting, everyone has to do something to call attention to what's happening, said Esteban Quezada, 58, a hardware store owner in Barcelona who closed, it, closed his shop to join the protests in Spain's second city. Things have to change. Money has ended up with all the power and the people have none. How could this happen? So it's an interesting case of an anomaly there, a shopkeeper taking the side of the uh, um, workers and the uh, uh, middle class people. But uh, uh, I think uh, he's shown uh, some uh, comprehension of what's going on in doing that. But another article in uh, Reuters analysis, European austerity protests far from revolution. So uh, this is telling us this article by Nicholas uh, Minoker and Mark John on November 12th that uh, uh, they called a uh, leftist uh, meeting to decide what to do about the French government's uh, belt tightening, it's called. And uh, this uh, triumphantly mentions that only five people turned up at the Café Malador, a favorite haunt <laughs> of the radical left. Maybe that's the reason. Right. Even in the city, quoting where revolutionary credentials date back to 1789, the uprising that began at the gates of the, uh, this, its famous prison calls to build a Europe-wide popular front against the toughest budget cuts in a generation are falling on deaf ears. Millions of Europeans feel impoverished as countries which broke budget rules for years are prodded into public spending cuts to win back investor confidence in their sovereign debt. <laughs> ah, the uh, theme of investor confidence. Uh, again, bursts of street anger have rocked Greece and Spain, two southern countries whose citizens are paying dearly for the profligacy of their past leaders. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's really, well, again, uh, a matter of uh, finding out who's to blame. And uh, it's really the... Uh, uh, leaders who have defi been defying uh, neoliberal uh, doctrine and uh, uh, spending too much on social welfare 
uh, measures and the so on and uh, so on and uh, uh, helping the uh, helping the poor with um, these uh, socialist measures as we're being told so uh, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of times we promised last week we would say something about neoliberalism uh, what that implies how it has taken over much of the capitalist world and therefore the entire world uh, since the uh, 70s with its themes of deregulation, privatization, and globalization and uh, um, what it has accomplished in uh, various countries in uh, altering the distribution of uh, income uh, resources and the like. So uh, the resistance movement that has grown up about that we is something we may come back to, but uh, are we anywhere close to something along the lines of 1789 or 1848 or even 1968 in any of these cases? Uh, this article tries to debunk that. I'm not sure myself, but I'd like to get your views about that, and there I'll stop. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, good stuff. Uh, David, you want to take a crack at this? Well, you mentioned 1848 and David Harvey, when he was uh, lecturing here last week, um, begins his talk and his current line of thinking about with 1848 and the response, uh, the rise of Louis Bonaparte or mm -hmm. Louis, Louis Napoleon. Uh, or is it Louis Bonaparte or Louis yeah. Napoleon? Yeah, yeah. yeah Louis, or Napoleon to, III to or Louis Bonaparte. Napoleon III to mm -hmm. power in France and how he did that and the reason the the, the 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 way in which the crisis of 1848 was addressed or perhaps subverted or the re re revolutionary potential was subverted was by taking capital it, it, you know Harvey refers to crisis regular crises in ca in capitalism and the way it was responded to was by doing enormous public works programs and that meant that uh, modern Paris was built with right. its boulevards and edifices of various kinds uh, was built in this uh, in this uh, period subsequent to 1852 Grand when Joe. Louis came came to power. Um, so the the question becomes: What does it mean that that capitalism uh, um, suffers these recurrent crises? What's the nature of these crises? And of course, the nature of it has to do with with profits and and declining profits. And what, where do declining profits come from? Well, one place that declining profits can come from is when the workers start getting too much spent on themselves, either in forms of wages or in government programs, which lessen inequality and provide a social safety net. So crises in capitalism, crises in capitalism can, see, can be seen to have a kind of ironic aspect to it, just like when we, We've referred to the crisis, crisis in, in you know, dem democracy that was declared in the 1970s. It wasn't a crisis of not enough democracy. It was a crisis of too right, much. Right. And so crises of capitalism occur when too much of the benefits of the perhaps potential benefits of capitalism or increased productivity or profits find, find uh, their way I I into the hands of the general social good rather than into the hands of what is now being referred to as the one, one percent. So, how is it that that this these crises in capitalism? How does that relate to modern Europe? I mean, in many complicated ways. But when you when you raise the issue of Spain, for for instance, where does money go to make exorbitant profits? Well, one of the places where it went was to Spain and into the housing market in Spain, just as it went to the housing bubble in this country. It was a way of sort of making an end run around all the difficult things about investing in businesses and worker productivity and selling products and all the, all the things that, that capitalism is supposed to hang its hat on in selling itself to the broader po uh, populace. But instead, the, all of this excess capital that, couldn't, that wasn't getting rewarded enough uh, found its way into certain areas, one of them being Spain, 
And it's worthy of note in that context that Spain, unlike Greece, was not one of the countries that was suffering, that was uh, that was running up government debt at that at that time. It was running a fairly balanced balanced budget within this kind of uh, social uh, social welfare state context. Not nearly as much of a social welfare state if you as you've got in France or Northern Europe, none of which, by the way, all of those countries which uh, in Northern Europe protected themselves from the kind of uh, uh, crisis in ca capitalism that you have in Spain. But all that money flowed into Spain, increased property values, uh, sucked enormous, am um, enormous amounts of wealth out of the uh, the the economy, the you know the real economy, so to speak, the the fundamental economy, and what what we end up here with is Spain being a part of the European Union, having to um, having to answer to not being able to uh, deal with its own currency issues and its own budget issues, but having to dance mm -hmm. to the tune of the European Union. So I have a whole series of things which. Uh, through no fault whatsoever, you know, in Greece you could make a little, a little case about government profligacy, cor corruption, people not paying taxes, and so forth. Spain has every right to to feel that it's been victimized by uh, the kind of, kind of neoliberal uh, activities which you which you refer to, and therefore we're back at the point of of. Uh, Create uh, addressing a crisis in capitalism by trying to increase profits, but creating a worse crisis in the meltdown of various countries. Uh, what do you think of the uh, thesis that, uh, uh, well, the business cycle uh, points to something that's inherent in the nature of capitalism? There will be these boom and bust periods, and the only way of avoiding them, as much uh, of Northern Europe was able to was uh, more regulation uh, of the economy. So after the Fed for deregulation for a long time, we find that the most successful economies in escaping from the crisis starting in uh, fall of 2008 mm -hmm. were those that were most heavily regulated in uh, Northern Europe, Canada, and a few other places that have some form of uh, welfare state or uh, what some call socialism. Yeah, I mean the it's important to d distinguish the the um, cyclical aspects of a capitalist economy, which rise and fall with productivity levels and union for, for formation activity and uh, and decreases in profits and and so forth. There's an aspect of that, but the speculative economy has been, I think, is seen as being separate from that and the consequences of of speculative booms and busts, especially one in the housing market, as 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 we've seen now, um, can't be addressed in quite the same sort of uh, you know uh, sort of regulatory ways. I mean, it calls for a more fundamental ex ex examination of how finance capital works all, all together, because it's 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 not just the 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 basic conflict between. Um, Capital and labor, o owners and workers. It's this financial aspect and the and the manner in which it's taken over the the which is illustrated by the fact that the the percentage of profits in capitalism over the last thirty or forty years that are attributed to financial financial gains, what's called fire uh, fin finance, insurance, and real estate, have gone from ten to fifteen percent of of profits to thirty to forty percent of, of profits. And I make, want to make a distinction here, too, uh, Ron, uh, between uh, socialism and social democracy uh, in terms of this question of regulating economies and the economies, the capitalist economies that have weathered the storm, so to speak, to the extent that they have um, over this last generation. I mean, the way to do that, how to do that, has been clear for about a century. I mean, uh, when Keynes is writing about this uh, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, what he's doing precisely is trying to 
describe how a government behaves in order to take that boom and bust cycle, uh, to, uh, to, to at least minimize the boom and bust cycle, uh, if not eliminate it entirely. And the mechanisms are pretty straightforward, pretty obvious, and so forth. And they're opposed only by those people who profit from the boom and bust cycle. Was it J.P. Morgan who said that in a recession, money returns to its rightful owner? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, hey, it's this, it serves somebody's interest. Uh, so, so the mechanisms have been clear for a long time, and the countries that, you, as you rightly say, uh, uh, survive the crisis best recently uh, are the ones who simply use those, uh, uh, th those mechanisms. Socialism, however, uh, it, it seems to me that it's getting to be time to repristinate the language here, which has been thoroughly corrupted in that century. Um, in, the f in the most basic sense, socialism means simply democratic control over the economy. Uh, right now, our economy is under no sort of democratic control. The, the essential elements in the economy at large, the investment decisions, how you're going to spend the capital, how you're going to spend the money uh, in order to produce, uh, uh, those decisions are made by a group of people uh, sitting in a boardroom in New York or London or someplace else like that, you know. Uh, there's no sense in which this is democratic, either the people who actually do the work or the people who will buy the products, whatever, uh, or the people who live in the community communities that are structured by these, uh, the, the, these corporations have nothing, almost nothing, to say. Uh, Noam Chomsky says that if you want the best example for a modern tyranny, look at a modern business corporation. Uh, it's, a, it's, a totalitarian, it's a totalitarian structure. Uh, democracy has no place in it. Well, socialism simply would replace the totalitarianism of our uh, economic system with democracy. We have the forms of democracy in the polity, but we don't even have the forms of democracy in the economy. Socialism says put democracy in both. Yeah. Now, social democracy, however, says, okay, we've got cap capitalism here, we're, we're uh, doing what we can with capitalism, but the government, uh, however undemocratic, the government has got to se step in and regulate uh, that economy because otherwise uh, it will devour itself like the Kilkenny cats. And uh, that's, we've got about a, a century of, of practice to show that that's true, the sort of thing that uh, uh, David Harvey is talking about. Which brings us to neoliberalism, which seems to me to be the top, the, the term that really needs the, uh, 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 perhaps the most work in putting it into our discussion. You're quite right. You summarized, I think, Harvey, by saying that uh, neoliberalism includes principally deregulation, privatization, and globalization as its three. But the point that needs to be stressed, I think, under that is that it's an attempt by the one percent, it's an attempt by the economic elite to seize back control that it had to, that it had to concede to social democracy over this last century. And they've done a pretty good job of it. That's the amazing thing that we, uh, we sometimes miss. Thirty years of neoliberalism in the United States, beginning, or thirty plus years of neoliberalism in the United States, uh, has produced, as you have pointed out frequently here before, uh, growing and accelerating inequality in the state. And so the inequality that reached a peak, if you like, in the late 1960s has gone just the other way. And the distribution of wealth in the United States now is back, is today, back to, the, back to what it was in the 1920s. So uh, neoliberalism, neoliberalism is a counterattack. It's a conscious counterattack by the rich uh, against social democracy, and they're winning. We've covered some of this ground before, I believe, when we were talking about Hyman Mensky, the uh, post-Keynesian uh, uh, economist who claims that this is an inherent feature, again, of capitalism, especially of prosperous periods uh, like the uh, 80s uh, and uh, 90s, um, where uh, the demand for uh, ever uh, greater profits uh, begins to uh, erode uh, the system. Capitalism must always... Uh, expand or die, and it has to keep growing or uh, else it will come to an end. That's, it really can't tolerate a uh, steady state, and uh, he advocates what he calls bubble-up economies rather than uh, trickle-down, and we've been hearing a lot of uh, discontent about the neoliberal uh, theory from a number of economists now, uh, the younger Galbraith, uh, Stiglitz, uh, Kru uh, Krugman, and uh, so on, who have pointed out for this tendency of uh, uh, unrestricted capitalism to uh, destroy itself because of the demand for ever 
uh, greater profits. Um, uh, it's inherently self-destructive. I think uh, one of the one of the uh, debates has to do with I'm, I'm, I'm reading a book called Chasing Goldman Sachs, which isn't a very good book, but it's a decent enough account of the of the meltdown and so forth and the developments on on uh, on Wall Street in various ways over the last 30, 40 years. And the reason why it's uh, it's it's a specious argument that she's making in the book is that she's trying to argue that finance can that that Wall Street can be can be seen as as performing the function of a utility in our in our economic system and in our you know you know society, I guess drawing a par an, an implicit parallel to so to um, uh, you know electric companies and other other aspects of society which are seen as too important to be left to to private profit that the the, the public should have some some say in governing those and regulating those. Uh, because of the way markets work, so she's arguing that that the manner in which money's invested is a is a utility in that sense. But where I where I lose her and where she becomes an apologist for Wall Street is she's sort of acting like well Wall Street gets out of hand every so often and they develop mm -hmm. all these instruments for making all this money and they forget what their mission is. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know their mission is to make money yeah. and they'll they do as her book very well documents, they will think up of any means, pro productive in a real sense or not, to make the most amount of money in the shortest amount of period for the fewest number of people, regardless of the consequences to the society as a, as a, a whole. So the question becomes, if finance can be seen as a utility, and if it can be seen as a public utility, how would it, how would it be governed? And um, I think that from Keynesian to neo-Keynesian to more radical economists uh, like David Harvey or people mm -hmm. who identify with Marxism, I think the answers would be relatively different, although they all rightfully question the, the idea that it's somehow a self-regulating system. Yeah, yeah and uh, back to what Carl uh, said, at the bumper sticker level, as I've mentioned here before, uh, I think socialism is what you get if you start taking democracy really seriously. Yes, that's that's well put, and that yeah. seems to me exactly right. And that's the reason that social democracy can never be socialism, uh, because it can't allow that sort of democracy. The original sin of capitalism remains the fact that it takes what makes you human, fun fundamentally your activity, work is the word for it if it hasn't been corrupted, your activity of head and hands and forces you to sell that to someone else's direction in order to eat regularly. Now until you get that back, until you achieve democratic control over your humanity, uh, capitalism uh, will persist. And uh, that's the difference between, it seems to me, social democracy and socialism. Uh, it's precisely democracy, precisely control. Um, now, uh, the instability of social democracy has to do with the uh, complete competing interests uh, involved in the uh, attempt to uh, smooth off the worst edges of uh, the capitalist system. Uh, that will remain a, uh, a struggle uh, uh, pending uh, the coming of a real socialism. One more recommendation, re recommendation here. Uh, David mentioned um, David Harvey's discussion of the eight revolutions of 1848 and the developments in France. Uh, one of the best things, and I must say also one of the most accessible things uh, Karl Marx ever wrote, was a little pa pamphlet, really, not much more, called The Eighteenth Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, which was about the transition from the revolutions of 1848 to the establishment of an authoritarian rule under uh, uh, the nephew of the great Napoleon. Um, now this, uh, uh, this is interesting because he, this is Marx not being theoretical. He's talking about the actual historical development and how the theories, if you like, are played out in the actual facts of the uh, mid-19th mid century. Uh, this is the sort of thing that we should be doing, it seems to me, here, and uh, I think we're trying to do today. What do you understand by the term Bonapartism? Um, roughly authoritarianism, but in a... Uh, 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 authoritarianism, uh, author an authoritarian political system in a burgeoning capitalism. Uh, 
or is not in a, in a late capitalism, so yeah. to speak. I think we, just to conclude with what a couple of references to what Harvey is arguing in his latest book, and I mean what he generally argues and what he said in his lecture here, um, I, I think he 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 has he has a, a very good way of making things seem a little bit simple, although they're com complicated, and he wouldn't want them to be oversimplified. But he he did emphasize the basic dis distinctions between use value and exchange value and the relationship between those two and how that plays out in capitalism, investment, and so forth, and by how which exchange value is seen to be dominant over use value, and, and that becomes, and out of that you get things like housing bubbles, uh, these sort of spe speculative excesses. And the other distinction he made was between development and, and growth, and that probably be need, needs to be qualified because I think the word development in terms of the the literature on the development of the third world and stuff, I, I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a more philosophical or moral uh, di distinction between um, genuine development in society that benefits society and growth, as in GDP growth, which uh, is uh, our monetary values that can signify almost anything uh, that that is said to cost money or is assigned Ex exchange value. So I think that uh, these are c all complicated con concepts, but it's worth simplifying them so as to sort of then go from there to try to understand what those really might mean in, in the real world and how, in how we address these, these problems about what kind of society we want to have if, if the 99% can ever understand that it has a right to have the society that it wants to have, that it doesn't have to listen to the 1% or have it dictate what kind of, what kind of quote-unquote market society we want to have. Development in that sense is what Marx is referring to when he says that the uh, transition from capitalism will mean that the full development of each is the condition for the full development of all. That is, the human development, the flowering of one's humanity. Uh, and uh, this is the sort of thing that uh, uh, means that every time Marx tries to talk about a post-capitalist world, he lapses into poetry, naturally. You're watching uh, News from Neptune, uh, and we'll go to David Green for perhaps a new topic. Well, let's go back to uh, let's go back to Gaza, uh, since that's what's on the agenda this week. The and latest not be eyeless, huh? the, the latest uh, the latest Israeli assault on Gaza. Uh, I won't go into the details of that. I assume you know we have an informed audience about that. Um, I I again um, you know find myself going back and considering what's. What's the best way to explain what what this is? It, it it really is in situations like this where the inversion of, of of reality becomes most obvious, and it's become most obvious because it's so well documented what reality is. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the midst of all of the Palestinian struggles with Israel and the occupation and so forth, it, it, there's uh, the the human rights. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty and various ac academic and Palis joint Palestinian, joint Palestinian, Israeli, or, or, or organizations have have well documented every aspect of this conflict in economic terms, in human terms, in violent terms, and so forth. And so, um, it's 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 important to under, understand in that in that context, in that documentary context that in the political context that the United States, you know, as, as Noam Chomsky reiterates en endlessly, the United States and its surrogate Israel are the primary rejectionist, are the rejectionist parties in any uh, peaceful settlement to, uh, to this conflict, whether in terms of two states or, or whatever other proposals. Uh, whatever binational or other proposals might be on the table at various times, that since 1967, since the since the war and the occupation of the entirety of of mandatory Palestine by by is, is Israel, that there has been, um, as Rashid Khalidi pointed out when he was here a few weeks ago, that the United States and its diplomats and its in our leaders in State Department have been the primary underminers and, and you know, re, you know, rejectionists in, in preventing any, any settlement, even when, pal when various factions of, 
of Israelis and Palestinians who wanted to kind of meet on their own and, and, figure, and figure stuff out, which is something Khalidi was involved in back in the early 90s prior to o Oslo. Um, in the context of the current, uh, you know, the, 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 the history of Gaza and of violence in Gaza has been so intense in the last 10 years that it's hard to, you sort of have to look back and realize all of the incursions and the ongoing violence and, and try to sort all that out. But uh, let me just remind, uh, remind you that when Israel pulled out, pulled its settlements out of Gaza in 2005, there was again, there's again, again good studies and documentary ev evidence to show that this began a sort of strangulation and seize of Gaza. The opportunities that were there for the economic development of Gaza in this context were, were rejected by is, is Israeli policy. Uh, this has been well documented by a woman named Sarah Roy mm -hmm. at Harvard, and um, believe and, it or not, and and uh, yeah, and so <laughs> and so there's never been any uh, glimmer of genuine hope that Gaza and the West Bank could evolve into a viable Palestinian state, which was exactly the goal of Israeli policy to continue to limit those opportunities mm -hmm. to expand on the West Bank. In the meantime, the wall was built on the West Bank, or the wall had been and continued to be built on the West Bank during this period. It's worth saying that since 2000 or 2001, that Gaza militants have fired various rockets, various kinds of rockets, all of which are referred to as Qassam rockets. It's not a, a technical term. It's just a, a, a you know, you know, generic term for any rocket that the Palestinians have come up with, apparently yeah. relatively more so sophisticated. But during this entire period, if one wants to get into the technical arguments of looking at who provoked what and who fired first and who broke the truce, it's clear from, again, all the documentary evidence that there there is usually a low level of Palestinian rocket fire, and when it gets low enough, then Israel, and there's a, tru a truce and there's talks going on, that Israel at that point decides to assassinate someone just as it decided to assassinate the head of the, uh, of what's referred to, of, of the militant wing of ha Hamas in, in the last, in the, during the last week. So there's, there's really, um, there's nothing in the documentary evidence that 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 allows us to understand anything that, that the Palestinian plight to be other other than other than resistance to Israeli occupation and Israeli efforts to to use that resistance as a way to inflict further further punishment. Well, you got a take on that? Oh, no, I uh, think I'm. Uh, uh, in agreement with, or I'm comfortable with, as they say today. Yeah, <laughs> they brought yeah, all right, minds yeah, of that, yeah. right? That's, Wonderful. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, yeah, there's a lot going on uh, now in uh, uh, the Golan as well. The conflict has uh, spread there. And uh, what do you think is going on? Where will it stop? Uh, um, I don't know. I uh, have very bad feelings about the whole thing, but. I think one of the things that has to be in a minute about you know, where it would stop is, is to realize that the choice to carry on the current bloodletting uh, is a conscious choice by Israel to keep the war going. I mean, even the assassination of al Jabari, the guy who's presented in the, uh, uh, the, the news as the military leader of Hamas, the political party that's in charge uh, in, in Gaza, uh, the, the murder of al Jabari is interesting because, in fact, although he is described as a military leader, his recent role has been to try to bring the various groups in Hamas under the control of the Hamas government in order to establish a, uh, uh, in order to maintain the ceasefire. He was actually working on the ceasefire with backing from the Egyptian government. Uh, and one of the, re it's reasonable to assume why he had to be eliminated from the point of view of Israel is because he presented a danger of peace breaking out. And uh, the way to keep the war going was to make sure that the major figures involved in establishing and maintaining the ceasefire was killed, uh, which is exactly what the Israelis did. Um, second problem, it seems to me, is that in, from the accounts that we get 
in this country which are about as uh, twisted as anything in the American media, and that's saying something, um, I thought were, was wonderfully set up by this morning's headline in the New York Times. Um, the, uh, and just, you, know, you have to see that very carefully, nothing special. It's just the headline in the Times that says, Israel and Hamas step up air attacks in Gaza clash. Now look at the assumption that there's this clash going on. Who knows where it came from? Uh, Israel and Hamas, essentially equivalent uh, uh, yeah, actors, yeah. Uh, uh, step up their air attacks. Don't you know about the Hamas Air Force? Well, exactly. <laughs> They've unleashed the fearsome Hamas Air Force full of high-tech airplanes from the United States. Yeah. No, wait a minute. Right. Hamas doesn't have an air force. Right. Israel does have uh, probably the third or fourth best air force in the world uh, made up. Hey, you paid for it. You might as well enjoy it. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, but, but that's this even-handedness of the New York Times account. And the New York Times here is not unusual. The New York Times uh, is, is simply doing its job as the flagship paper, setting the tone for the rest of the media, who will all talk about uh, this uh, even, relatively even conflict. And the U.S., as the honest broker, has to decide which, which, which side is guilty in this case, who provoked this particular crisis in the way that David just explained. And therefore, the State Department says, of course, it supports Israel's attempt to defend itself. <laughs> now, you know, this is a, a classic term. When Germany invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939, the German Foreign Office issued a press statement entitled, We're Finally Shooting Back. <laughs> Germany was defending itself by, against those Polish terrorists, they even used the term, uh, by sending uh, the Wehrmacht into, into Poland. Okay, you know, the, yeah. pattern's, the pattern's clear. Did you ever read online, you know, Goebbels, uh end of year statement uh, uh, in 1939 that uh, this was all started by uh, Poles making raids uh, into uh, Germany exactly. uh, across the line and uh, uh, harassing and, and injuring German citizens. And, and uh, so we had a right to defend ourselves. And this, is, this is precisely the language. The only difference is that they're talking about the Hamas rocket. Most of them essentially homemade. These yeah, are big yeah. firecrackers. Eh? Yeah, they um, have they're, no they're sky rockets. System. I mean, you know. Um, and uh, the fact that, uh, I mean, yeah, the, the, the account is uh, absolutely symmetrical. Um, by the way, I might mention that um, uh, for those of you watching us uh, locally, uh, as it were, uh, thanks to uh, our engineer Caleb, a lot of our uh, material ends up on YouTube, and you may be watching this on YouTube. I hope you are. Uh, but if you're watching it locally, uh, in real time, as they say, uh, on Friday evening, the 16th of November, um, this weekend there is a uh, market at, the Lincoln's, at Lincoln Square, at which the local anti-war group aware will be present, and one of the things they'll be doing is uh, distributing an article by Mox Isle, uh, who's David, David's mentioned frequently here before, about the origins of this particular figure phase of uh, Israeli military oppression of the Palestinians. Uh, come by and pick up a copy. Uh, or you, you should, of course, come by and pick up a copy. And, or if you want to read the article and you can't make it, you could go to Jacobin blog, uh, where the article was to be found. Jacobin fits well with our previous references. <laughs> Quite right. Uh, and is a, is a great journal, by the way, which you should, which you should subscribe, subscribe to if you have extra money for that sort of thing. And you're watching uh, News from Neptune, uh, and we have, uh, there's obviously a great deal more to be said about the, uh, uh, the situation that the, that's occurring in the, uh, uh, in the greater Middle East. And remember, of course, the principal actor here is uh, uh, the United States. But at least for a change, I would just add, if you, if you don't mind, uh, complicated by the fact that Egypt has a new government now. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in that context. Indeed, yes. Uh, and that is very much in the calculations of the United States and Israel as they launch this particular uh, uh, military adventure. Uh, we come now to the point in our program where we have instituted a new department that we call Coburn's Corner. Uh, Coburn's Corner is mentioned in uh, honor of the late Alexander Coburn, who, uh, in his last published work, 
uh, talked about, uh, gathered together, things he had written about uh, peculiar political language and the way in which that language corrupts our discussion. Uh, his, the Coburn, Coburn's corner has an edge, so to speak, uh, indeed a sharp edge. Uh, Coburn's last writing was a pamphlet entitled Guillotine, uh, in which he nominate, nominated cliches, overused phrases, and tedious words for elimination. And we want to carry on his great work by adding our own suspects to the kill list. Uh, this kill list is a lot less lethally, literally lethal, of course, than Barack Obama's kill list. Kill list. And I have a nomination tonight, a nomination that came up in discussion this week uh, and the wake of the election. My nomination for the kill list, uh, literary kill list, is uh, Tough Decisions. Oh, yeah. uh, the little man elected uh, congressman in this district announced immediately it was clear he was elected congressman that he looked forward to going to Washington and making the tough decisions. Now this bit of language is very interesting because tough decision means uh, something to be done by the government that is contrary to the interests of the majority of his constituents. Uh, like cutting Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, uh, increasing the defense budget, uh, doing something else uh, in that regard. So when you hear politicians, particularly even little local politicians, talk about going to Washington to make the tough decisions, know uh, that your fat is in the fire. Yeah. What it uh, sometimes means, maybe often means, is decisions that are contrary to the interests of most of your constituents. Exactly. Well, yes, that's, that's sometimes the point. Call, also called leadership. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, but, and it's worthwhile specify whose interests they're in, since yeah. they're not in the interests of the majority of the constituents. Yeah. They're in the interests of what Occupy Wall Street calls the 1%. And these people know it perfectly well. I mean, uh, so, you know, tough decisions, yeah. yeah. When you hear it, uh, beware. Are you beware because you'll be called on to make sacrifices. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. Everybody has yeah. to sacrifice. Of course. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Almost everybody. Almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another instance. Are you comfortable with that? <laughs> Ron, do you have a, a nominee yeah, for the yeah. guillotine? Yeah. Well, these are some that turned up online recently. Having said that... Uh, you always oh, yeah. bring in more suspects than anybody else. I don't right, know what's right. going on here. Yeah. yeah, that's a real game changer. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of Obama's favorites, right, too, right. for a long time. Yeah, yeah, have we reached a tipping point? And yeah, yeah. Yeah, we need to drill down into the... Uh, Ooh. Particular Where do they get that image from? Right, right. But uh, uh, we make the Uber point... Uh, some Ooh, German here, yeah. that at the end of the day, it'll be awesome as, <laughs> as we're going forward if we do the math and yeah. get, reach an epic uh, conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. I heard him into the tumble. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, all right. Uh, iconic, I sh have to return to. That's I, you've mentioned that each time. That's yeah, it's your really iconic more and example. more <laughs> annoying. Are you iconic or awesome or anything like that, David? Awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, yeah, I have to um, second. Um, you you all, you stole my fire here because I only, I only came in with having said that. <laughs> but let me, but uh, let me say. I mean, I think that makes a good companion to Carl. Last week you talked about moving forward. Yeah, and right. I think that yeah. In a way, having said that, makes it's it's, you know, sort of performs a related function. Whereas the moving forward says, forget about. Right. Uh, what's passed, right. moving well, it forward. Kind of nullifies right. what exactly. having, having said that also right. is a way of sort of cushioning the the blow by like you know by uh, uh, you know complimenting someone and then and then and then acting as if you're not simply buttering them up by by saying by then criticizing them. So so the having said that sort of um, tell, uh, you know warns us that what has just been said is of no longer any any account we're we're moving forward. That's right. So as for instance I might say Caleb, our you know, our you know, you know, director at News from Neptune, you've been doing a great job. Having said that, imagine <laughs> how much better a job you could do if you came to work sober. <laughs> What is this, David? You're not happy with your camera sh camera angle yeah. there or something? I mean, uh, <laughs> well, I've been promising Caleb to fit him into, oh, the, into the discussion. And that's how you decided to do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. Wonderful. <laughs> well, so anyway, that's that. I don't have any more. Uh, I don't have any more off the top off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't have right. any more Actually, that one would work. Speaking yeah. off the top of yeah. my head, yeah. Yeah. I bottom, still have a head. Is so. that the bottom line at the yeah. end of the day? Or? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll turn Coburn's corner then. And uh, I, I uh, was prompted by one of the things that uh, Ron started with to mention something that came up this week. Um, uh, the uh, Professor Richard Wolff, uh, the economist who turns up in various places these days, uh, talking sense most of the time, it seems to me, uh, had a piece this week about uh, the situation in Europe that Ron began tonight's program with. Um, and uh, Wolff's uh, piece is entitled, Will EU Nations Turn Over Tax and Spending Sovereignty to Germany? Talking about the way in which this, uh, the political uh, developments of uh, Europe are playing out in the context of the drive for austerity, uh, which, remember, is finally a drive on the banks, insisting by the banks, insisting on being paid by these governments uh, whose revenues have dropped sharply with the uh, international recession. Uh, but the uh, role of Germany is uh, highlighted usually in this. And I was reminded of a novel um, from 1992 by Robert Harris entitled Fatherland. Um, interesting book. Harris is a former journalist and uh, an interesting novelist. Um, his 92 novel is set in an alternate history in which Germany won World War II. And the novel begins in still Nazi Germany in April of 1964 in the week leading up to Adolf Hitler's, who still exist, 75th birthday. Uh, the novel was a bestseller in uh, the UK and sold fairly well in the United States. But the reason it was a particularly bestseller in the UK was it was something of a success, success to scandal um, in that the alternate world of 1964 that, that uh, the alternate Europe of 1964 that Harris pictures with Nazi Germany going along fine turned out to look awfully similar to the actual world of 1964 in the eyes of most of its British or European readers. Uh, that is the role of Germany that is so central to the current crisis in Europe uh, had been essentially what it became by the 1960s. Um, so what was that war all about, by the way? Uh, yeah, you know, what, what, yeah. what was going on there? Yeah. Um, and I uh, ran into Ron last week reading uh, Nicholson Baker's brilliant book, Human Smoke, uh, in which he simply reads you the newspapers about the run-up to the Second World War uh, and points out uh, essentially how unnecessary it was and how it could have been avoided uh, in, even after September 1st, 1939, in all sorts of ways. Um, looking at the history of the current problems uh, seems to me to be something that uh, we'd think our media would do and of course don't, uh, and it really is important for us to do. Uh, our own mentor, Noam Chomsky, wrote one of the most important books, uh, important long articles about in this area, uh, entitled The Background of the Pacific War in which he talks about uh, the fact that modern America is fixated on the, uh, modern American politics is fixated on Pearl Harbor. Uh, everything was going along swimmingly and then the dastardly Japanese attacked the U.S. in 1941 and uh, the U.S. has uh, to, had, had to fight enemies all over the world ever since. Uh, that's an argument that needs to be uh, uh, set aside. That reminds me of the brilliant scene in uh, Sacha Baron, Baron Cohen's movie Dictator, in which he describes what would happen if uh, the country is taken over by dictators. <laughs> and it sounds, you know, 99% of the way exactly what we have uh, today. Yes. But it, it seems like also what we're dealing with in our culture is, is uh, at this point, is a very sanitized view of war. I noticed during the Veterans Day, the, you uh -huh. know, the four-day, the four-day long Veterans Observance uh, last weekend that, uh, veterans are talked about, um, the military is talked about to a certain extent. Places are referred to, people have, uh, are veterans of Afghanistan, Iraq, and so forth. But, but the only war that really gets mentioned is World War II. Yes. If at all, uh, the other wars, especially the ones that we're currently fighting, don't get mentioned. They sort of stay in the background there, and you're wondering, well, how is it that we get all these veterans to what, you know, to what what is it that causes all these veterans to actually to actually occur? And um, I think that the 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 discourse and the rhetoric around Veterans Day kind of is a certain acknowledgement or certain at least unconscious acknowledgement that these wars aren't fairly popular, so we can't really talk about them. 
But it's, and it's also the point that we have a wonderfully mythologized war here, World War II, yeah. the greatest generation and so forth, that, s that stands in for the real politics and the real wars uh, that uh, the United States fought in living memory and is fighting today. So it seems to me that dispelling that mythology, uh, and the best way to do that is by the real history, uh, the sort of thing that indeed Marx was trying to do in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, what actually happened here, uh, rather than uh, uh, theoretical reflections, may be the way to do it. Yeah, it was the good war. Uh, yep. I'm not saying anything about all those sort of accrued sins. In fact, uh, it was Studs Terkel who wrote a book under that title, The Good War, in which he mainly, he interviewed people in it. And uh, you don't have to read very far in the book to realize that Studs was being remarkably ironic in his title. He meant something quite different, that, uh, that he has been, uh, the, the Second World War was seen as the good war. Uh, there's another story, he said. You've been watching News from Neptune for November 16th and the 46th week of 2012. Our program is named in honor of Noam Chomsky, and this has been, of course, the Evil Empire edition. If our program interested you, you might want to look for similar programs here on Urbana Public Television, now streaming online at urbanapublictelevision.org uh, slash live stream. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, the David Pakman Show at 7, 2 p.m. This program will be repeated on Sunday at 4 p.m. Labor's Worldview. On uh, the weekdays next week, 7 a.m. Democracy Now!, 8 a.m. The Big Picture. And by the way, I think Tom Hartman is doing a particularly good job this week now that the election is over. It's helped him. Uh, and uh, at noon, weekdays, The David Pakman Show. Monday at 2 p.m., the Tom Hartman program, his call-in program, uh, which I must admit I haven't been able to watch through yet. I've watched some of. But if you want to call and talk to, talk to Tom, you can do that here through UPTV. And Tuesday at 10 p.m., Aware on the Air. I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussions tonight on News from Neptune have been David Green and Ron Zoke. This and other editions of this program can be seen on the website newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook. I can be reached at Carl at newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook. And I'm happy to receive your comments. Our thanks to UPTV, UPTV or Band of Public Television, especially Jake, Jason, and Caleb. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune to remind you in the words of Edward Devere, what's past is prologue, what to come, and yours and my discharge. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies, and a good night to you.